Okay, so last lecture we said, you know, we saw that Taylor has this logical argument for determinism, right? And his argument depends, I think, crucially on excluded middle, right? This statement, this idea, this claim that for every statement, the statement is either true or false. Taylor says it holds for every statement, including statements about the future. Aristotle, who disagrees with Taylor on this, would say, well, excluded middle holds only for statements about the past and present. So, remember, you know, Taylor's whole argument stands or falls with excluded middle. And remember, his challenge to someone like Aristotle is going to be, well, what makes the future special, right? If you admit that excluded middle holds for everything else, why should the future be different? Well, one challenge to Taylor is that there are clearly some statements that excluded middle doesn't hold for. You know, he says, well, excluded middle holds for all meaningful statements. I can give you a bunch of statements where it doesn't seem excluded middle holds. The present king of France is bald. Martians are green. Superman likes Snickers bars. Lieutenant Phil Jones served on the Enterprise 1701D for two years. 1701D being the starship from um, Star Trek The Next Generation. Now look, present king of France is bald. There is no present king of France, so we don't know, right? Martians are green. There are no Martians. So again, statement, you know, seems to be almost nonsense in a way, right? And now one thing you might just say is to say, well, you know, okay, statements about Martians or the present king of France, those are just false. Excluded middle still holds for them, right? You know, that to me, that seems like, well, now it's somebody like Taylor who's going for a solution that just seems to save his argument. But think about Superman likes Snickers bars, right? Lieutenant Phil Jones served on the Enterprise 1701D for two years. You know, those don't seem to be clearly false. You know, it's kind of artificial to say, well, these are false. Just because they talk about Superman and Lieutenant Phil Jones and the Enterprise 1701D, which don't exist. You know... I don't know if it's ever been established in the comic books whether Superman likes Snickers bars or not. I'm guessing it hasn't. I mean, sometimes comics go pretty deep into this. Like, um, I think there's a kind of cookie that the Martian Manhunter is supposed to like. He's he's kind of a Superman knockoff, and like kind of appropriately, I think the cookie he likes is a um, is an Oreo knockoff. Anyway. Um, I don't know if it's like a little in joke with the comic book writers or not but anyway you know the comics have never said whether superman likes snickers bars or not just not clearly true or false lieutenant phil jones he's just a guy i made up you know seems weird though just to say it's false he served on the enterprise right so i think what these statements suggest is that excluded middle does not clearly hold for many things that don't exist. Present King of France doesn't exist. Martians don't exist. Superman, hopefully this is not going to break your heart, does not exist, right? Snickers bars do, but Superman doesn't. Lieutenant Phil Jones and the Enterprise 1701D do not exist. So excluded middle doesn't hold for these statements. Or at least it doesn't obviously seem to. 
And the thing they have in common is they all talk about things that don't exist. So I think you could say to Taylor, excluded middle, this statement has to be true or false, doesn't hold for things that don't exist, that are fictional, or otherwise don't exist, right? Well then, one question if you want to know whether excluded middle holds for the future is whether the future exists. Kind of an odd question, right? This is what philosophers would call an ontological question. Ontology is the study of being and what it is to exist. What is it to say something exists or that it is, that it has being? That's what ontology studies. Question of whether the future exists, ontological question. Does the future exist and does it exist in the same way as the past and the present? If the future doesn't exist, or even if it exists in a different way than the present and the past, then it's not so clear that excluded middle has to hold for it. So Taylor would say, well, look, he will say excluded middle holds for all meaningful statements and statements about the future are meaningful. But I think this kind of dodges a question. Does the future exist in the same way the past and present do? If it does, then Taylor's argument would seem to work. If it doesn't, then excluded middle does not necessarily hold for the future. This, I think, is a natural way to interpret why he and someone like Aristotle would disagree. Aristotle, I mean, or I'm not an I'm not a scholar of Aristotle, so I'm not going to put words in his mouth, but someone who takes the Aristotelian position would, I think, say, look, the future does not exist, or at least it doesn't exist in the same way the past and present do, that's why excluded middle does not hold for it. That's how it can be true that we can change the future in ways we can't change the past and present. Taylor, on the other hand, thinks that the future does exist in the same way as the past and present do. If you believe that, then quite naturally, you also think that excluded middle would hold for the future in the exact same ways it holds for the present and past. Would seem that his argument would then work. Now the question that we need to ask though, is does Taylor offer any real argument for this claim that the future exists in the same way as the past and present. It seems to me that whether excluded middle holds for the future is going to depend on this claim, and does Taylor offer any argument for it? If he doesn't, then I think it might be fair to say that his argument begs the question. Right. Remember way, way back from our stuff on logic, begging the question in the sense philosophers are interested in it. Begging the question means you assume what you need to prove. Taylor doesn't really, I think, give a lot of argument for this. The closest Taylor comes is to say that all meaningful statements Exclude, you know, excluded middle holds for all meaningful statements. 
So I think he would say, you know, look at our statements about the present King of France and Martians and Superman and Lieutenant Phil Jones. Those statements are not meaningful. Excluded middle does not hold for meaningless statements. Those statements are not meaningful, but you know what? Statements about the future are meaningful in a way these statements aren't. You know, I, 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 I don't know, right? I mean, for one thing, it kind of seems weird to me to reject these statements about fictional characters or non-existent things as meaningless, right? You know, there are some statements that are pure nonsense that if I if I say them, they're just not going to mean anything to you. They might sound nice, right? Um, you know, if you've ever read Alice in Wonderland or seen the Disney version, there's this nonsense poem, "'Twas brillig and the slithy toves did gyre and jimble in the wabe." Right? That's nonsense. I mean, that sounds cool. Um... It's like a little cat that sings that in the Alice in Wonderland movie. <laughs> you know, that sounds cool, but it doesn't mean anything, right? You know, it's like, I don't know. But Superman like Snickers bar seems meaningful in a way that statement isn't, right? Talking about a dude who served on the Starship Enterprise seems meaningful in a way that that statement does not. But let's just grant Taylor his argument that statements about fictional beings are not meaningful. Well, then I think we can just push the matter back and say, well, look, why do you, Taylor, assume that statements about the future are meaningful, right? If these apparently meaningful statements about Superman or Lieutenant Jones are not meaningful, why do you say that statements about the future are? All meaningful statements excluded middle applies to, well, why then assume that statements about the future are in fact meaningful? And I think that Taylor's response is, well, statements about the future seem meaningful, right? If I tell you Joe Biden will win the 2024 presidential election, that certainly seems meaningful, right? I don't know, right? You know, for one thing, he's already excluding statements about non-existent things, fictional characters being meaningful. That seems odd to me. You know, statements about Superman seem just as meaningful as statements about Biden winning the 2024 election. I don't know. But let, let's assume that statements about non-existent things are not meaningful, right? Well, would then the fact that statements about the future seem meaningful mean that they are? I, I, I mean, I don't think so, right? There are plenty of statements uh, that have seemed meaningful to people that aren't, right? Um, take statements about discredited scientific theories, right? A hundred or so years ago, maybe a actually a little more now, scientists used to believe in this stuff called phlogiston, right? You go back and read an earlier scientific book and it'll make all these statements about what phlogiston is, what phlogiston does. Plenty of scientists thought statements about phlogiston were meaningful. We don't now, right? There are lots of statements that seem meaningful that aren't, right? You know, Take another one, maybe this is more controversial, but, you know, people will talk about energy fields and auras. Uh, 
Personally, I, I don't, I tend to think those statements aren't meaningful, but the simple fact that they seem meaningful to some people doesn't mean that auras and energy fields actually exist and those statements are meaningful, right? So, so I think you could just say to Taylor, it's like, look, you go from the fact that a statement seems meaningful to it is. That, uh, no, 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 right? If, if, if that little logical move worked, then phlogiston would be real. We could go from the fact that people talk about energy fields and auras to those are real. No, Taylor, that's, that's a slippery little move you make there, right? So, for me, I'm very skeptical about his argument because, you know, I don't know that if the future doesn't exist, then excluded middle applies to it. Taylor would say, well, talk about the future is meaningful, so the future has to exist. I would say to Taylor, talk about the future seems meaningful. But that doesn't settle that it is. And, you know, I, even if I grant you, Taylor, to be meaningful, it has to really exist. The fact it seems meaningful doesn't show it actually does exist. All right. So that's my main reason for not buying Taylor's argument. It's not clear to me that the future exists in the same way that the past and present do. And if it doesn't, then I don't think his argument works. Now, there's one more thing I want to add. Um, this isn't strictly necessary. So you can kind of go through this more quickly. I hate to say you don't need to listen to this because I have this feeling everybody will shut it off at that point. But it's not quite as important, but I do think it's interesting. There's a more radical challenge that you can level at Taylor, which is just to say that it's not clear that excluded middle even holds for all meaningful statements in the present. The consensus view of philosophers and mathematicians, you know, these being the two groups of people who deal most with logic, computer programmers come in there too, but, you know, philosophers and mathematicians, you know, probably deal more and more in a more foundational way with it. But the consensus view of philosophers and mathematicians is that excluded middle does hold for all meaningful statements. Here's the thing, though. It's not crazy to doubt this. You know, Taylor kind of says, well, it's a law of logic. The thing is that not all of the laws of logic seem on equal footing. There are some, and I won't get into what this is, but, you know, there's some like non-contradiction that seem pretty fundamental to most people. There are others, and excluded middle is probably the best example, people are more skeptical about. Most philosophers and mathematicians accept excluded middle, but some have doubted it. And there's reasons to doubt it, right? And the big one is that excluded middle actually seems to set you up for some nasty paradoxes. Even just in talking about the present or past, excluded middle can seem problematic. One statement that it's hard to see how excluded middle holds for is the so-called liar's paradox. Liar's paradox is, I am now lying, or this statement is false. There's a lot of ways to set this statement up, right? Problem is, it doesn't seem that this statement can be either true or false, right? If it's true, I am now lying. Well, if I'm lying, then what I have to be saying, by definition, lying is saying something false. So if the statement is true, it's actually false. And by definition, if I'm saying something false, I'm lying. So if the statement is false, it is by definition true. Don't 
try too hard to wrap your head around that. You know, paradoxes, you know, watch old Star Treks. Captain Kirk always gives these to robots and their heads explode, right? Don't, don't short your brain out trying to think of the paradox. The point is, it doesn't seem that this statement can be true or false, because if you try to make it true or false, you get a contradiction. So the liar's paradox is one reason that some people have been skeptical of excluded middle. There's a lot of different versions of this. It shows up in philosophy, logic, and mathematics in different ways. I won't bore or confuse you guys with it. Just know that this is one reason some people doubt excluded middle. Finally, another one. Another reason that people doubt excluded middle is the so-called sororities paradox. And there's different ways to set this one up. But, think of it this way, right? Suppose, as is the fact of going bald, I say this from, you know, genetic inheritance, I know what my own future looks like. Yeah, I guess that's one true statement about the future, I'm gonna lose my hair, right? I'm in the process of losing it, right? But look, let's say you're losing your hair, right? Is there a specific point where you were bald you weren't bald, then you lose one hair and you are, right? Excluded middle says for every, every statement is either true or false. Well, at nine o'clock, it's either true or false that I'm bald or I'm not. Or sorry, that it's either true or false that I'm bald, right? Well, but also think of it this way. There is going bald as a process so, you know, clearly at the end of the process, you're bald. At the start of the process, you're not. Is there some point where you lose one specific hair and you weren't bald before that and you are after, right? If excluded middle is true, it seems like there is, right? Nine o'clock, you're not bald. The statement you're bald is false. 901, you lose that one final hair. That's the sharp dividing line. After that, you are bald, right? That is bizarre. What seems much more natural to say is that in these processes where there's a transition, there's a middle state where it's not really clear whether you're bald or not. You know. But if excluded middle is true, you know, that can't possibly be the case, right? It has to be true or false when we say you're bald. It can't be, well, not clear. That seems to set you up for this weird claim in the sororities paradox that there is one specific point before which you're not bald, you lose that one hair, and now you are, right? There's a nice joke with Bobby Hill in King of the Hill talking about this. Um, they've got Bobby on Ritalin. He doesn't need to be on Ritalin. Now he's just focused on everything way, way focused. He's in the kitchen and he says, there's some milk in the fridge that's about to go bad. Long pause. And then his little Bobby Hill voice, he says, and there it goes. This is funny for a lot of reasons, but one of them is it doesn't seem that there's like one specific down to the second time where the milk in the fridge goes bad. This seems like something that's stretched out. My wife just tosses it the second she suspects it. You know, me, I'll often take a little sip. And the natural thing to say is, well, I don't know. It's not fresh. I don't think it's bad, though, quite yet. Anyway, so the long and short of it is, even if we accept excluded middle for all meaningful statements, it's not clear that we have to accept that statements about the future are meaningful in ways that statements about the past and present are. That seems to assume that the future exists in the same way that the past and present do, 
that's not something that someone who disagrees with Taylor needs to grant. More radically, I do think there's some room for doubt about what, whether excluded middle even always holds for the present. But that gets you really, really deeply into some really complicated, I think interesting but complicated and confusing questions in logic and metaphysics, so we'll leave those behind.